Sorry, no problem. Thank you for my voiceover uh, artist there. Uh, we also move into our Skylark micro vehicle as well. That's a two stage vehicle increasing in complexity. So we've got to deal with two stages now. We've got to deal with the staging problem, which as many individuals will know is a, quite a, a difficult thing. We also deal with increasing the complexity of our team, increasing their operations and improving this over time. We successfully launched our Skylark micro vehicle in Iceland last year. I had the opportunity of uh, leading the operations for that. It was very, very exciting. Very, very good to conduct operations from abroad as well, which is something that is very, very uh, interesting to deal with, especially when you the, the common rule is no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You start out with what you think will happen and then inevitably something will change and you'll have to adapt to that and successfully be adapted to it as a team. Moving on to our next vehicle, and not let yet launched, but we hope to launch very, very soon, a Sky High vehicle. Similar two-stage vehicle, however, it's sort of a hybrid setup. So it's HTPB and high test peroxide. We're now introducing our key propellants into our actual system. So we hope to launch that soon. That will go up to about 70 kilometers in altitude near space, but not quite space just, just yet. That will be a good bolstering and a good improvement for our teams. Also, we're having proper flight grade avionics on that system as well. So we're improving the technology readiness level of our system as we're bringing on, on the sky high, as we're bringing on our flight vehicles as well. Of course, our, one of our flagship vehicles that you probably have seen in the news, the Skylark L vehicle, liquid bag propellant vehicle. It's the first vehicle which is using our main propellant combination uh, of HTP and kerosene jet one so that is our vehicle which we will be using as our commercial revenue generator for suborbital flights. So there's many, many uh, companies that wish to use suborbital vehicles to test experiments and then bring them back down again. We hope to be able to service that. That vehicle is a, a very capable vehicle, 120 kilometers possible altitude, max 3.5 altitude as well. We also are then moving on, assuring that we are improving our readiness, improving our capabilities, improving our processes, and also improving our technology development through our learning more and more from these vehicles. Hopefully, after we've completed all of these series of smaller tests, it'll be a lot easier to move on to a larger vehicle, the Sky Polar XL. Now, very, very exciting. Uh, we'll be testing our 70 kilonewton engine very, very shortly. That'll be the first major milestone for our, in fact, I'm not telling a lie, it's not the first major milestone for our uh, Skyboard XM vehicle. We recently tested our third stage of the Skyboard XM vehicle using our smaller 3.5 kN engine in December of last year. That was our last major milestone to close out the year. And hopefully we'll have some more major milestones as we move on towards the end of this year as well. The first of which being our 70 kN engine. Very excited about it. I can obviously dive into the, the details of this as well if you want a little bit later on. However, it is a liquid bike propellant vehicle. It is a large workhorse vehicle. We've got nine engines on the first stage. Second stage being one 70 kilonewton vacuum configurated engine. And then the third being a smaller 3.5 kilonewton engine. Totaling all that up brings your payload capacity of about 350 kilograms into low earth orbit. So very, very capable vehicle. Looking forward to, to developing this in the near future. So why, why is this vehicle unique? Why are we looking to bring this out to the service market? We've got four key USPs which we want to bring in and show to our customers, show to the people who are looking to get their satellites up into orbit and looking to answer some of their problems and questions. One of them being a quick and simplified access to space. We are able to turn around the vehicle using a, our key manufacturing technologies of additive manufacturing, similar commonized elements, and also our tank manufacturing technologies as well, all produced in-house and able to get you to launch 25% faster than the current small sat uh, availability right now, that being 12 months, us being eight months at full uh, development. So we can get to space faster. That's one of the key milestones. In addition, carved into our DNA and carved into the walls of our company is sustainability. We look to be an eco-friendly way. Our propellants, and I'll go into this a little bit later, combined with our kerosene additive, our kerosene derivative, eco-seam, produces 45% less CO2 
and your normal liquid oxygen up to one cell. So that's something which is key and something that we, we look to add in into the, the DNA and the architecture, the physical structure of the vehicle itself. In addition, for those companies who can't afford to spend 100 grand up on their testing program, that's fine. We can accommodate that. We have lower G loading. We've got a much lower thrust to weight ratio than our competitors as well. So we can bring in vehicles that have less testing requirements and less hoops to jump through in order to get to orbit. We can service those satellites. In addition, we have a very, very unique capability bringing into this new trend of orbital transfer and orbital maneuvering vehicles, our space tug, which is effectively a boost up third stage, two third stage stacked onto, one of the, one of the, onto each other. We can have our third stage vehicle, we can keep it in orbit for up to a year. We can perform the deployment of our satellites, but we can also do a number of different things as well. We can also service satellites, we can also service existing satellites up and in and around orbit at the same time. And then when the time comes, we can deorbit satellites as well, adding to that sustainability aspect of Skyrora. So this was our key milestone of last year. This was the test of our third stage vehicle. This third stage, uh, we call it the third stage, the additive with the additional fuel tank, we term the space tug. Of course, without its thermal blanket here, which you would need for its space capability. This was the full flight weight vehicle. This is the actual vehicle which we would use, the actual article which we would use to launch satellites, to launch experiments, to launch anything like that in space. We tested that at our engine test facility in December of last year, a very, very exciting milestone. And it turbocharged our progress into this year as well. We've actually brought up to TRL-8, so the, the final stepping stone before we actually launch one of the key components of our XL vehicle. So it's becoming real very, very rapidly. We hope to do that this year with our second stage as well. So the primary mission of the third stage, and I'll just go into that in a little bit detail now. So the primary mission of the first is, of course, to deliver satellites. We can do them singly in the dedicated mode, or we can also deliver satellites in different modes as well uh, as part of the ratio model. But of course, a much smaller scale than our, our larger competitor counterparts. That's designed for constellations. That's designed for this new trend of bringing more satellites up into orbit and phasing them into different orbits as well so that we can get much more capability than perhaps one big satellite can. We can achieve that with our propellant combination. The way that our engine works, we can actually reignite our third stage engine multiple times over the orbit. So we can deliver satellites, we can also service satellites. We can see here with our, our space that we've got quite a cool robot arm. Well, which uh, is one of the, of course, uh, design opportunities that, that we may have to actually collect satellites and um, examine satellites and potentially repair or refuel satellites in orbit for the future. And where we're, where we're going to do this from, now you've seen in the news, of course, that Scotland is a key geographical location for launching satellites into orbit for the future. So one of the key advantageous points, we are geographically advantageous and um, that we can get into polar and synchronous orbits from where we are. And as such, we've got three main launch locations for vertical launch that we are currently chasing for uh, flight. And that's not just ourselves, that's also seen global attention. So we've got companies coming from all across the world that are looking to achieve vertical launch from UK shores, which is really, really exciting. However, that's not the only places that we can launch from as well. Skyroda, we also have a containerized mission. We've also got a containerized approach to our launch as well. We base everything in shipping containers so that we can move anywhere within the world. We can also set up and test within seven days, which is a, a key, key, key test um, of our readiness. So we're rapidly deployable across anywhere on the planet, which means that anywhere that's got either polar or sun synchronous capability, we can launch from as well. Equatorial too, but the, the key main orbits are polar and sun sync. That en enables us to launch from, of course, Iceland, which is one of our previous launch locations for the Skylark micro mission. It also allows us to launch from the Azores, from anywhere that's got our northern and our southern shore. Again, bring that into it as well. We also just closed a, a memorandum of understanding with the German offshore. Uh, spaceport as well, which some of you may have seen on the news. That also brings offshore capabilities into our launch as well. So we really can go from anywhere. So the momentum is definitely in our favor for launch. 
So once we launch, once it's launched through, once it's very, very exciting, uh, we get our vehicle up into orbit. That might be the end for the news. It might be the end for some of our satellites and first customers that are deployed into orbit, but it's not the end for us. That might be the beginning of our first space tug program. So in orbit and at command from our, our new rocket factory, we can control, maneuver, and enact the mission of the space tug, which might be for a number of reasons, um, servicing of satellites, it might be analysis or observation of satellites for degradation over time. It might be deorbiting of satellites as well. We don't know, so we have to be prepared for anything. That's something that's key for us um, in development of the future. It's something that's ingrained into key selling points also. Now, of course, to achieve all this, we can't simply rely on the vehicle itself. We have to rely on a number of other systems for its development. That's been the ground segment. Very, very similar to how SpaceX started with Falcon 1, just in the background there. Containerized approach is fantastic. It means we can duplicate our setup. It means that we can actually set up launch sites from multiple locations across the world, future speaking. Also with our workshop setup, also with our ancillary support setup as well, how we develop, how we set up our stores, we modularize everything, which means that if there's any issue with any of our containers, we can swap it out very, very quickly. So there's no uh, compatibility issues for that. These are our main systems that we have. We need to, of course, build with our fuel and our oxidizer, add the compressed gas to supply that. And our power as well. We also have a command center there too, so we can take command from anywhere across the globe for our launches. It'll be local command and there'll also be distributed satellite command, uh, ground station command as well. One of the unique things that we can do with our Skylark LV vehicle is launch from the rear of a trailer. Just as you see in the bottom corner there, we have what's called our transporter erector, uh, which was actually successfully tested in our recent Skylark L static fire test in May of uh, this year, that's last year, my goodness, uh, time flies. So that was uh, successfully completed, successfully tested our vehicle, you'll see it just um, later on. And that's what we actually used to launch our vehicle from. We can roll it out from its transport director, verticalize it. It's got a flame trench built in to launch right off the back um, of that, pickup, uh, off that uh, trailer. So it means that we can really go anywhere the launch requires and desires. For the larger vehicle, of course, we're still the pickup truck, and I'm not entirely sure that will work as a much, much bigger solution for a 24 meter vehicle. I don't know if uh, many roads can actually sustain that. So we, we, we look for a more traditional solution. We've got spaceport partners across um, the UK and beyond, but of course there's lots of spaceports being developed as well. Potentially part of our sport, space sport might look a little bit something like this with our main rollout for a pad or vehicle integration building to integrate with the satellites uh, just across the way. We've also got our main fuel and uh, propellant farm and our main fueling and oxidizer systems for the actual vehicle, <laughs> as well as the other ancillary systems such as our lightning towers uh, to ensure that we are safe in the operations. So something not too dissimilar from this might be popping up around about um, Shetland um, or other spaceports across the UK and across the globe as well. So how do, we do, how do we actually achieve that? We've got a number of key infrastructure elements, a number of key places I work uh, in order to actually facilitate this. So for a rocket, you've got to design it, build it, test it, launch it, and we can achieve all of that in-house which is one of the, the very, very interesting things that we can do as Kagora, being vertically integrated with this company means we don't rely on supply chain much and the delays that come with that in order to actually get a vehicle to orbit. So just up top is our rocket factory, so rocket assembly facility in Cumbernauld. Um, brand new facility, 50,000 square feet, opened up and that allows us to assemble our Skagora XL and our Skylark L vehicles. This is the engine test site we have for the development of our 30 kilonewton and our real engines. And unfortunately, I can't show any photos, but our 70 kilonewton engine as well. Very, very exciting. You'll see that very, very shortly, I'm very sure. We can also develop all our other systems as well, our avionics, our flight test systems, 
our uh, flight termination systems as well, our gains navigation control, all the programming for that, all the software for that, all the test benches, you name it, we can do it inside. In addition to that, we have the 3D printing. We've got Skyprint 2, which is just in the middle right now, and we've also got Skyprint 1, the robotic arm, just in the bottom left, this, which is we can actually print our engines in-house. Now, of course, this is still a developmental technology that we have, and um, DED technology, if anybody's familiar with 3D printing. This particular technology allows us to print very, very rapidly and prototype our engines, prototype the new components, and iterate and improve upon our design. So effectively, in one side of the Cumberland factory, you can walk in with rock raw materials, and then the other side, you walk, walk out with the rocket. You don't have to leave at any point. Very, very exciting. So to enable our sustainability and credentials and to enable our, our green nature, we also use EcoSim as well, albeit a developmental technology. EcoSim is a recycled derivative of kerosene, recycled using plastics. The plastics that you normally find in a landfill somewhere going to waste, we can actually use that, turn that into equivalent to Jet A1, uh, kerosene, and we can put it back into our engines as well and use that for a flight. So we're actually doing good to the planet, removing the waste that we have and actually using it for the betterment for the applications of the satellites that we are sending up as a result. So you can see we've actually successfully tested it before in our engines. We've performed approximately 45 engine tests with our Leo engine using EcoSeam. It's got better, slightly better characteristics in some cases than RP1 sorry, a JA1 uh, equivalent, and is key for improving our sustainability credentials. And also we'll be looking to roll out to different places as well. So you might find a small ecosystem plant at your local Glasgow or Edinburgh airport, turning the plastics that people are normally throwing away in the trash cans and the departures or arrivals lounge, turning that into jet fuel, putting it back into the vehicles, the aircraft again, and then getting you on your flight to uh, Alicante or wherever you want to go. So this is our route to orbit. This is tattooed on every sky or and flight arms. This is something which is key in, in, in our key milestones as well. This is, if, if you're a fan of video games, this is our leveling up over time. This is where we are. We are going to go a bit high level um, overview of our timeline so far. However, we are making great strides and great progress throughout. We're looking to conclude this year with the second, second stage uh, static fire of our second stage. And we're also looking for our simple and any qualification. We've got big ambitions and big goals. Of course, space in space, everything lives to the right just a little bit. However, we hope to achieve them and then who knows where we could be in the future. Our key milestone, and I think everybody, every uh, UK based new space company's key milestone for launch is December 2022. This is the key. This is where we plan to launch, and this is where we plan to develop our Skyler XL vehicle, turn it on its end, and get ready to go for its first demonstration flight. Of course, it's not possible um, for a vehicle based on heritage to actually be developed and have longevity for the future unless we inspire the future generation to come along with us, do the learning, be part of the employees and employers of the future community of space. So that's why we have a massive skills gap in the UK. A lot of the original uh, Black Arrow engineers, the key pioneers of the UK's first launch vehicle, have actually died out in their knowledge with that as well. It's, it's uh, unfortunately very tragic. So we look to inject that back into the UK again with learning and with our outreach um, opportunities. So we bring in uh, students, we bring in engineers, from all walks of life, all capabilities, and get them hands on. We throw them into the deep end with our projects. We've got two of our recent interns developed our uh, small RTV vehicle there for avionics testing. It was testing of our ground tracking stations. So they built a vehicle with prior knowledge that went to about Mach two and a half. A very, very um, fast vehicle for, for not a lot of experience. Um, they also were involved in not just the development of the vehicle, but the development of the whole manufacturing process for themselves as well. How do you actually build the vehicle? How do you actually do the documentation, set up your factory, set up your facility to enable that? So it's the whole um, you know, ecosystem 
all getting a vehicle to be developed in the end of launch that is something that we want to imbue our students with. And that's definitely something that we look to do going forward. We've actually got a recent injection of interns here, just around our original Black Arrow, which we've got in a new facility. Uh, the, the, one of the actual pieces, the transition ring of the original Black Arrow R3, I think, that launched uh, into space and, and landed in Luna in Australia. So we do a collaboration with the students, we bring them on, they're getting involved in real projects. They're on my test site very, very quickly from, from day one almost. And they get involved in projects for the development of our launch vehicles. Why? Because we need people to make this happen. And we need inspirational individuals, passionate, motivated individuals to learn fast, work faster, and get involved. So today, uh, I, I did say I would mention the, the uh, vehicle trailer. This was just a recent photo taken from our coming on facility. So today we have our launch vehicle at the ready. We have all the momentum behind us. We also have our key milestone tests coming up. A Skylark L launch where we are ready to go. The vehicle is ready. We're still working out um, our final operations plans and we'll be set to launch that very, very soon. In addition, we've got our key milestone tests coming up for the development of our second engine, our second stage, and then eventually moving on to our first stage as well. So the momentum's in our favor. The UK, Europe um, and the, the world is turning slowly more and more to a European based launch capability. So they're moving our direction as well. We are certainly very, very excited about what the future prospects are for launch, what the future prospects are for ourselves and how you all can get involved as well at Sergora. And of course, we just need to make it happen at the end of the day. So just before I go, just to review the, the responsibilities that we have, and of course, um, Skyroad as a company have as well. We have priorities that we need to uphold. And of course, um, that is, is part of our, our reason why we develop EcoScene, but also why we get students involved as well, and why we, we bring these presentations to yourself, why we have sustainability, the focus, and a future uh, growing element within our launch vehicles and within our outreach as well. So thank you very much. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. But uh, otherwise, thank you. Okay, so let's take questions in the hall, but also um, if people online, if people online want to put their questions into the chat, we'll alternate between the, the room and the Zoom chat. I'll watch the chat. If Okay, we can all watch the chat. Great. Thank you. Hopefully everyone heard me as well. Uh, I didn't see any shit. Yeah, I, I, I was texting someone in California who said they could hear you, hear you well. Perfect, so, perfect. Excellent. Oh, hopefully I won't be too long. Okay, so that's the first question from Kahur over there. Uh, yeah, you, you, you mentioned that you're, you're uh, talking about the, the low, low G environment. Yes. And your customers didn't need to put the satellites on the shape table, etc. And you said then that you had a low thrust to weight ratio. Yes. Now, of course, if your thrust to weight ratio is low enough, it won't take off. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, what's your philosophy in terms of using lightweight materials? And in particular, I have an interest in composite materials, and you mentioned the carbon wrapping, etc. So, are your big rocket, and um, how does that equation work? Yeah. Um, and secondly, you know, what do you do to take weight out of the fuselage of the, the rocket itself? Yeah, of course. You just repeat the question for people online. Yeah, of course. So just the question details the two the two sides of the coin, we'll call it, of a uh, low thrust to weight ratio uh, to enable takeoff. If you reach that at one, you're not going to go anywhere. And um, also as well the the other side of that, which is the mass reduction, which is the key thing that all space companies will increase. So what to achieve, yeah, absolutely. Is the trade-off. So any systems engineers in the room I will know that that is the main the key trade-off. That's where it sits to the table of can you take what um, customer capability can you have at the end of the day. So whilst we want to do that, low um, thrust away ratio was a, a key USP for ourselves. Don't know if I can actually disclose the thrust away ratio, but um, the G loading as a result 
less than five. So you could probably figure that out. Uh, within that, we also G loading being the generic term, we also have sinusoidal and uh, vibrational loading as well. So that's taken into account into the design of our uh, thrust cells and the thrust pumps and the um, payload divider and the payload adapter as well. So you can actually, because of our experience, uh, had as a team coming in to this new space development, you can actually reduce the, the G loading and the sense of the vibration on the actual payload itself. So there's more of the metrics than just the, the G loading too. Um, but of course you still want to achieve uh, space you want to you want to actually get up there. So of the low G loading you have the low thrust comparatively, you want to minimize our, our weight, particularly particularly the dry mass of the vehicle. How we achieve that at Skyroda is we achieve that using our carbon load wrapped pressure vessel approach, which is a, a highly typical approach of new space companies. And um, through our experience that we have with carbon composites in the past, our particular engineers and developers that have had we are able to minimize the um, weight of our main structure using a carbon load over our pressure vessel approach. In addition, we also have the additive manufacturing capability through 3D printing as well. So part consolidation is a huge aspect of that. Reducing the part count on our engines allows us to reduce the mass. And it's a one-to-one a -one transactional relationship with that. So we've got very, very simplistic engines, uh, very robust engines as well, but using the, the powers and the benefits of 3D printing coupled with the composites technology as well. So do you use the mass do you own production of your COPDs? Yes, we do. Yes. I was there um, a couple of hours ago, so uh, my hands are still a bit higher than uh, if anyone's used to <laughs> composite uh, work. So there's a question online from Alex saying, can you say anything about the applications your customers want to launch? Of course, yeah. So it's a, it's a good question, actually, because a lot of the applications we'll already be familiar with. Um, future thinking and going forward, sustainability being one of the key uh, criteria for companies looking to get a better picture of the earth from above. We've got a lot of uh, customers who are very, very interested in climate observation, uh, observation. One of the key trends nowadays is hyperspectral imaging. So imaging of different frequencies, getting a better view, a different view on Earth is key, and so a lot of customers are interested in that. Earth observation, generally, as a whole, is a, a key interest of our customers, getting more and more up-to-date traffic information, more and more up-to-date uh, Google Maps as well. If you ever wanted to see where you were 10 minutes ago, then that is definitely something uh, or a novelty, but very, very powerful application that our customers have, also in different remote sensing aspects and applications as well. Question for me. Um, so I have a couple of questions regarding, I guess, your propellant and then the tank system as well. Sure. So first of all, why you chose to go with high test peroxide? Because I guess that adds to like your safety procedures, but then it's also like not cryogenic. So I guess you have some advantages there. And then related to that, at least I think it's related. Why did you choose to go with the nested tank system? Because that looks quite different from what gets done around. And if that's something to do with your material requirements or structural strength or just a characteristic of this, like not, not unusual, but like not typical, let's say, tank design. Yeah, sure. So I'll just repeat the question. Um, so question number one, why HTP? So why do we use high-test peroxide as one of our uh, propellant choices? Second question is why do we use our nested or coaxial tanks as we uh, call them? Very, very unique setup in comparison to other vehicles but also as well something which uh, we, what's one of our key technological advantages that we have. So the first question, why HTP? I think you've kind of sort of answered it yourself um, in, in uh, the approach. So HTP, whilst with the propellant combination not achieving quite as high uh, specific impulse as some of the more traditional approaches, the main benefit that we have is it's not cryogenic. As that is one of the key main benefits. The reason for that, propellant not being cryogenic, that's great. But also, it's all of the infrastructure that's around the launch site to keep that, that, to keep that storage tank there. And if we're looking at permanence for a launch site, or if we're looking at a, a very high expenditure in setting up a, a space port, that's something which, particularly for new space, particularly for the UK, which is very new to this whole idea of launch 
from its shores, that's not something that is necessarily going to um, have a take on a significant investment to allow that. So it allows us to go wherever we want to go. It allows us to set up with a minimal footprint as well. And also it's got storable properties as well, so we can keep it there for a long period of time. Uh, Scottish weather being Scottish weather, sometimes it's not the best uh, to launch from. So if we need to hold for any um, point, we don't have an instantaneous launch window. We don't have to wait until the last point uh, for the liquid oxygen to you know, just boil off just right to launch. We can actually fill the vehicle up and we can hold it there for as, as long as we need, as long as we require to enable launch window to happen. Same questions on the coaxial tanks. Uh, there's, a, there's a few reasons as to why coaxial tanks are, are quite good. Um, one of them being the, the uh, temperature differential between the two propellants is actually benefits to having them beside each other. Other being the support that you get for the internal um, kerosene tank. Overall, it's mass saving of the vehicle as you as, as we can employ our carbon over our pressure vessel technologies coupled with um, different technologies, you've got the actual kerosene liner as well. Um, we can reduce the mass. Of so are, just, are the tanks over wrapped themselves? The, or is yeah. it for your high pressure system? No, so the, I don't know how much the, I can ask, by the way. This yeah, no, of course, of course. No, the tanks are, the tanks are over wrapped. Okay, yeah, the, the tanks are over wrapped. Another question? Thanks for the talk. I think it was very, very interesting. Um, you were talking about uh, recycling some plastic, something to convert it to fuel. Has Skyrora looking into recovering some parts from the rockets and reduce it again for different launches? I mean, if this is something you have in the pipeline to do that kind of continuous monitoring or something of parts to make sure that achieve the super integrity requirements. Yeah, so the, the question being reusability, which is a hot topic nowadays, it's on every, every space company's cards. Of course, reusability is on our cards for the future. However, it's on everyone's cards for the, for the future as well. Something to look to gear towards and, and, and work towards going forward. We need to get a launch vehicle started. And yeah, that's, that's one of the key things. Uh, secondly, however, for the actual reusability of the parts themselves, Inconel is resistant um, to oxidization, particularly landing in sea. That's something which um, is preferential going forward. So we've, we've, we've thought about it within the architecture of the vehicle and the performance alloys that we use and reusability is definitely something um, to, to bring back and consolidate and reuse going forward. The reason that our engines are so simple means that the actual servicing of those engines as well is a lot more simple in comparison, in comparison to a lot more complex um, systems also. Uh, Jim? Um, um, so, I mean, you've talked about launching, having nine launches by 2025, I think yeah. it was. 15, 20 years into the future, how many launches do you anticipate and what, what would the production output be of your factory to meet the, the rocket with demand for that, assuming it's a modularized design that you'll be using? Of course, yeah. So the question is just being launches in the future, we are scaling up over time. Our commercial revenue generation in our model sits at 16 launches per year to meet our needs and to also meet current needs and demands of the market as future forecast goes up to 2030, I think is um, how the Bryce's forecasts are currently sitting at the moment. For the future, of course, with our manufacturing process, it's very, it's very it's been simpler, easier to do. Um, upping the production would definitely be something that's on the card, particularly if the demand was as is predicted and, and meets that and follows that, it's been going on. I'd be very interested to read the market reports for 2035 to 2040 and, and onwards as well. So we are working at full tilt to get to 16, and we can definitely accommodate that. If we need to go any further, then our economy of scale as we are developing, as we're going on, will, is definitely going to add to that. And, and you talked about your technology readiness level. Yeah. How do you monitor your manufacturing readiness level? With our, up? our processes themselves, very good question. The question is uh, with regards to manufacturing, Process readiness level of manufacturing readiness level. So, at the current moment, at the current phase, with our um, management systems that we have in place, we understand and we know that we're firmly locked into RD modes right now. We're actually developing our manufacturing readiness level criterion through our 3D printing uh, 
trials who are doing things like machines as well, because ideally those are going to be the first set of um, machines that need to be up and running. We need to print uh, a vast number of engines uh, to, to um, achieve our 16 launches per uh, year. So we're improving our manufacturing technology and capabilities and our readiness level for that particular um, avenue of our development. For the assembly of the vehicle and for the overall development of it, we have a different section. We have our composite sections and our aerodynamic sections as well, but the overall assembly process is very fairly matching up. Um, we're currently in R&D process at the moment, but I would envisage by the time that we reach our 16, uh, our target for 16 uh, vehicles per year, we'd look to be up to our full flow for achieving that capability of aligned with year on year, and then we would be back into our R&D process again from the past six years on. The cost savings, of course, of that 16 launches per uh, year will be improved upon and realised. Of course, the kind of scale that's in general works if you work on that manufacturing line year on year. However, our key KPIs and how we drive those KPIs in our processes and through our outputs as well will develop through our um, use. Uh, kind of ties in with a question online. This might be like asking a car company whether they're worried about traffic jams. Uh, so someone online has asked if you're worried about uh, space being too crowded. So it's the Kessler syndrome is the the, the key thing. Um, we are. We, we are uh, worried about that. Absolutely. I wouldn't say worried is this, the, 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 the word because being a team of STEM professionals and engineers, you know, the worry is just the, the problem you've not quite found a solution to yet, but we actually we have been working on that from the start. That's where our deorbiting capability comes into play with our space tug. So we look to service space and condition space as well as servicing life here back on Earth too. So of course, in the experimental and the R&D stage right now, that's all fine, but we do look to make that a real capability for companies, for governments who have quota and wish to deorbit their effectively space jump onto satellite and reach the end of its useful life, or alternatively, service satellites to prolong their life as well. So we don't need to keep launching up new satellites time and time again until the batteries die. We stick our charge in and then away you go. So that is something that we're thinking about, something we've got for our solution to. One more from your room. I'd like to like me again. You talked about the engines and propellant tanks. Yes. The fuselage for the XL is Meter and a half to two meters in diameter, something yeah, like two that. Meters. Yeah. What are you thinking of doing? How are you going to build the fuselage? Is it aluminium alloy or are you going to use composites? How are we going to do it? you build the fuselage? What do you design the fuselage for? Of the, uh, of the XL rocket. Of the XL rocket. Well, we're, we're building it right now. Um, so that's where I, that's where I was uh, okay. a few hours ago. Um, today's not a test site uh, afternoon day, so I don't smell of uh, Jet A1, which is good. It's more carbon composites uh, stuff. So. We are building our fuselage, which we call using a cobalt carbon overlap pressure vessels. It is big bare, effectively. The, the end of the tank is the end of the vessel. So the, the, the stage one rock is essentially a, an overlap pressure vessel. Correct. Correct. And what about stage two? Uh, same deal. Same deal. Same deal, yeah. Uh, carbon overlap pressure vessel, different technology for the kerosene coaxial tank. So it's one larger. Peroxide tank inside a smaller kerosene tank and um, sandwiched in the middle. Uh, so the whole vehicle is based off of a, a composites approach to fading as well as, as composites also. But it comes down to the metal, the plumbing is down into the engine, um, into the manifolds, and into the actual uh, the, the dry base and the structure of the avionics, and then the engines themselves and the internal of course. So there's quite a few comments in the chat saying great talk and encouraging. Uh, the last one I'll point out is this question saying, Are you accepting students in your placement <laughs> program? I think you can see a lot of students here yeah, uh, as well. So, we, we have a, an annual uh, student internship program. We're always on the lookout for talent, of course, never uh, a closed door. However, we do have a formal student internship program in the summer, and occasionally we have a student internship program in the winter as well, just depending on our demand. So, we always do bring on students. I would say the key message or the key thing that we have for students is having a degree is great and it gets you in the same room as everyone else that's got a degree, but it's what are the other things you do, what's the thing that sets apart, what's the key tools in your toolbox that you've got that sets you apart 
from everyone else. And those are the key things that we look for as a schedule. Okay. So, so anyway, we show you if you've got pressing questions that can catch you at the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, I think the biggest one was the, the accepting students. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one who's hanging on waiting. Short so answer, yes. Short yeah. answer, yes. They go to the website. Absolutely. Well, I'll just say a few words of thanks and um, information I'll come from. So, as we all know, rocket science is hard. Um, and once upon a time, it would have seemed ludicrously ambitious for a small company in Edinburgh, a few hundred meters from this room, to be de developing um, a spacecraft. But this evening, we've had a, a talk that presented us with a rational plan that made that a credible ambition. Uh, we've, sure, there are engineering challenges that you made a pound, 350 kilogram mass, 3,000 meters a second exhaust gases, but you can see that it can be done. That it can be done in a way that almost makes it normal. Almost makes it make sense. Almost makes it <laughs> normal to uh, develop space rockets in Scotland. <laughs> And it can be achieved without drama, but with vision and access to cutting edge technology. So you've just described an exciting path ahead, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room to have already written in biro on their hand, December 2022. Absolutely. If I got home with a tattoo, my wife would ask where I've been. <laughs> so we will look forward to December 2022 and hopefully have you back uh, to tell us uh, how it went and uh, we'll look at the bottle of champagne. <laughs> okay, so let's thank our speaker for an exceptionally clear um, presentation this evening. I also say that I really liked the speaker because at the beginning, when you're going, How will Zoom work? and which microphone is it using? and this sort of thing, the so I'm also a master of Zoom and setting <laughs> up pretty much by himself. First skill so, on my CV. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, you can come back. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, people online. We will end the talk and uh, see. Oh, I should say the next talk, I think, is 14th of December. Is it um, the drone company in this time? Yeah, what's an outfit? Flowcopter. Flowcopter. They're just beside us. So, the summer to Flowcopter Industrial Grounds. Okay. Information on the website. Okay. Thank you.